Russia, Iran, Europe and China are working hard to counter unilateral U.S. sanctions against Iran, part of Washington's efforts to undermine a 2015 nuclear deal with Tehran. And it seems to be working. Most European firms have ignored a blocking statute by the EU meant to protect companies from damaging measures by America in case they trade with Iran. The withdrawal of these businesses from Iranian trade has undermined Europe's desire to portray the nuclear deal with Iran as a flagship foreign policy victory and symbol of the EU's growing strength. President Donald Trump introduced a series of sanctions targeting Iran's financial, automotive, aviation and metal sectors and threatened that more sanctions ratchet up to yet another level in November. However, Russia and European Union officials have outlined an action plan to resist US sanctions against Iran. The second wave of US sanctions is due to start on the 4th of November 2018 and hit Iran's exports of oil and its derivatives, as well as the country's banking sector. Trump has pledged to bring Iran's oil exports to zero, to which Iranian officials have responded that they will try to sell as much oil as they can and protect banking cooperation with foreign countries. Iran's first vice president has summed up Tehran's view by stating that the US says it will zero down Iran's oil sale is baseless, although reductions in the oil sales are possible. Is America right or wrong to refuse to cooperate with Iran over the international nuclear deal? And how should we regard America's willingness to bully the European Union and others to follow Washington's lead? Simple questions with important answers. Does the public here in the UK think that the US has chosen a unilateral approach to global politics? And why? We ask them. Donald Trump is just going out on his own and trying to either make friends with people who no one wants to make friends with or making en enemies with people that everybody thinks should get together. I'm not really sure. I mean, I suppose things have changed since Trump's come into power. The politicians they have in charge are isolating themselves and they're not helping themselves. I think they're creating more enemies than they're getting friends now, which is a real shame. I think that they are thinking about themselves first, but they should think about that. Their country is very powerful and it affects everyone else. I think his whole regime is based upon connecting to U.S. for America first, isn't it? Make America great again. So, of course, it's U.S. centered or he'd like to make people believe it's U.S. centered. Yeah. I mean, he's only thinking of himself, I think. I don't think he stands for anything except for himself. I think he puts America first and I don't approve if that's what you're asking. I don't think he's he, he's got the right picture. I think he's he's wrong in lots of things he does. Well, America regards itself as exceptional, as being above international law, as being above the United Nations Charter. And what we have seen since the end of the Second World War, and in particular, in my opinion, in the last 25 years, is an America that totally disregards the United Nations, totally disregards international law. And the result is this. America today is the most violent, the most criminal, the most murderous and the most dangerous global player. And there are no ifs or buts about that. The evidence speaks for itself. America played an extremely important role in the dismemberment of Yugoslavia. America launched the invasion of Iraq. America turned Libya into a failed state. And of course, hundreds of thousands of Syrians have died and have died violent deaths because of American geostrategic objectives. So America is a tremendous force for instability in the world. It's very clear that not recently, but historically, um, America has, um, it calls itself an exceptional uh, uh, nation. Therefore, everything that it does is ex exceptionally in benefit of the USA. Um, so it has done unilateral 
decisions, whether it's a unilateral war decision, whether it's unilateral commercial decision, whether it's unilateral trade wars. Very clearly, USA decides to take its own line. Yes, superficially, it may have partners that it works with. I mean, for instance, uh, in, in Syria and in Afghanistan, they say they've got, you know, alliance of the willing who are fighting there. But really, you know, the 30, 40 nations, they're so, sort of tiny islands somewhere in the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean or Latvia and, you know, tiny countries in Europe that no one even recognizes. Uh, so they support it and they say that they've got the sort of uh, um, support of the world. But really, the reality is that USA wants to follow its own policy. And Mr. Trump says America first, but really America has been first in the uh, eyes of their presidents in the past always. Russia, Iran, Europe and China will intensify work to counter unilateral American sanctions designed to undermine the 2015 nuclear deal with Tehran. What are the public's thoughts? We had potentially a, a, a deal to actually have dialogue with Iran to get them to not develop nuclear weapons, where right next door you've got Israel with massive piles of nuclear weapons, even though they never actually admit. Uh, at this stage in, 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 in life, you actually go ahead and try to scupper that deal. And instead of having dialogue, you go and have dialogue with uh, North Korea, where, you know, they've clearly... <laughs> have got capabilities to actually deliver nuclear weapons uh, versus Iran, who haven't even proven that they can launch nuclear weapons and you have, you're stopping a deal. So it just seems crazy. Probably depends on the situation. Um, I guess the example being the, the climate one, um, the, the climate uh, Paris Climate Accord. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm quite upset that he kind of pulled out of that one. Um, but then the other viewpoint is that that, that deal wasn't strong enough. I don't know what's going on in America. It's, it's a shame because if we sat down and talked to Iran, we'd have some really good, you know, trade, you know, I mean, it's the thing, like, we're, we're looking at a post-Brexit world, all these trade deals. Iran's a very large market, but now they've scuppered the Airbus project over there and Boeing. So it's putting jobs here at risk. So I think it's up to our politicians to go to America and go, listen, what are you guys doing? Sort this out, you know? Again, they, they should think about all the, the world, not just, you know, the continent. It's just every, everyone in the world. It's huge, and they are taking it as if, if it wasn't important. It comes back to Trump's politics, doesn't it? I think he's, he's, he's not a globalist, is he? He doesn't think sort of outside of um, an American framework of thinking. I think that's where his constituents relate to him from, don't they? His electoral. I don't understand why he's not interested, um, because if, if it is America first, um, it would seem you, didn't, you wouldn't want to lose your sphere of influence around the world. But that's exactly what's happening. Because of Donald Trump on America first, which I think is very regressive and not a good idea. The Trump administration are trying to keep things in-house instead of sharing things around the world. It's very difficult to see how the Iran nuclear deal can survive in the long term. Without America there, I suspect the deal is all but dead. Nonetheless, we should applaud the Europeans, and in particular I'm talking about the uh, Germans, the French and the British, for maintaining their support for the deal and for maintaining their policy that they will continue to trade with Iran and will continue to invest in Iran. But alas, I can't see how uh, the Russians and the Chinese in tandem with the Europeans will prevent the Americans from going ahead with what is arguably uh, the most hostile stance to Iran since the uh, Ronald Reagan. I think the issue is very uh, complex and interesting. Um, Iran is not isolated at this moment because obviously USA wanted to isolate Iran from its global position and also its trading partners. But what is becoming clear is that over the last two years, especially since uh, Mr. Trump came into power, uh, USA has been applying sanctions with its neighbor, Canada, with the, uh, you know, the European Union partners, uh, sanctions on Russia, uh, 
tariffs on China at this moment. And in the last 24 hours, there's been huge sort of discussion now that the retaliation that China would be imposing on uh, USA is going to be quite colossal in the sense that um, China holds, um, you know, sort of uh, uh, paper uh, in trillions of, of dollars, which if China decides to sort of uh, not buy in future more of their American securities or dispose of the existing ones, that could hurt USA very much. So the reality is that the sanctions have failed, will fail continuously. Yes, it will have, um, especially in the Iranian context, if you like, ordinary people will suffer some pain. But I think the, the war that is uh, that USA is imposing on its partners and other nations, I think in the end, USA would not be able to bear the pain as the other nations may be able to. The Russian deputy foreign minister has criticized European companies, saying they're wrong in refusing to cooperate with Iran due to US pressure. Does the public agree, and why? Uh, so I'm not surprised. I think it's disappointing that the world seems to be moving away instead of coming together. Uh, we can't seem to find room for dialogue, more room for threats. So absolutely, I think it's disappointing. We've got to work hard, especially with Brexit, and, and make as many deals as possible. So being limited by uh, America or anyone else is, is a bit of a difficulty for us. They don't really have a leg to stand on. They're very hypocritical. It's a double standard. And some of the things they've done over the years, I don't think they've got a right to turn to Iran and say, no, these companies can't trade with you. At the end of the day, the companies are supplying civil aircraft, it increases aviation safety, they're supplying parts, that, you know, it's free trade at the end of the day, you know. And they're trying to, with what you said, they're trying to, uh, that people just work for them and they, they get more powerful, but that's not going to help at the end. I think it's good. I think that I think I will wait to see how it pans out. But I think actually it's good to actually stand up um, and exercise your sovereign power, really. I think the world's a pretty big place. And I think the middle class is getting bigger in emerging markets, um, the BRIC countries. And uh, I think, the, again, the China's um, Belt and Road Initiative will, will increase that trend. So I think it's a mistake to think that America, while it is a massive market um, and it's a, a wealthy country, I think it's a mistake to only consider America. I hope it's true. Um, I suspect that America has such control that that might not be possible. I like the idea that, I mean, we're, we're one world, I thought, you know, and I personally, I mean, I, I have friends throughout the world. For British, French and German companies, the Iranian market is a very, very prosperous one. And if you have a look at the trade that London, Paris and Berlin has annually with Tehran, it is extremely impressive. However, you cannot compare the trade and investment between, uh, on the one hand, Britain, France and Germany uh, with Iran uh, compared to their trade with America. America has the most powerful economy in the world. It has a market of 300 million people. And whilst we should applaud the German business people, the French business people and the British business people for wanting to keep on trading and investing in Iran, the political pressure will be so intensive that they will sit down, they will reflect on the situation and they will conclude that whilst it is a great shame that we can't trade with Iran anymore, ultimately the American market is more important. And from a business sense, it pains me to say, I do understand where they are coming from. Well, there's a sort of, if you like, a bit of a conundrum for a lot of the European uh, companies, particularly if they are multinational operators, i.e., as you know, the larger companies like Total, <coughs> the banks which um, have a lot of business in the USA, or car manufacturers uh, like BMW or Mercedes that sell in the USA at, uh, also, they are somewhat reluctant to obviously um, 
uh, continue doing business with Iran because they feel that they might lose out on the U.S. market um, and there may be some other sort of penalties that the USA may apply to these countries. But there's always a market for smaller companies, the uh, small to medium enterprises who contribute in every country in a significant manner compared to very large corporations. So those smaller companies will continue to do business with Iran. But I think in reality, the situation is that um, each nation, each corporation will decide what it gets the benefit from doing business with Iran and what are the penalties that may be applied by the USA. So as I said, it's a, it's a bit of a difficult situation for a lot of European companies at this moment. But the reality is that the European Union at a political level, if you like, wants to carry on um, having commerce and commercial relationships with Iran. The figures provide a clue as to why America is willing to do all this. US exports to Iran amounted to just 120 million euros of goods in 2017. In the same year, the European Union exported goods and services worth 10.8 billion euros. America has a population of 325 million compared to the EU's 512 million. And the trading distances vary too. From Washington to Tehran is 10,200 kilometers, compared to just 4,080 kilometers from Brussels to the Iranian capital. President Donald Trump's national security advisor says the Europeans have to make a choice between the US and Iran in observing American sanctions, which he claims have been more effective than expected. How does the public feel about this? No one can be 100% right and the other 100% wrong. So you, know, you only need to have uh, room to actually go back and talk. So I think that's absolutely... The threatening talk and behaviour is not good, not productive. Like I said, for, for us, it's, for, for my business, it's an easy question. Uh, we get a lot of business from America. Um, we have to side with America because we'd be cutting our nose off to spite our face. To me, I trust the Iranians more. They're trying to keep this deal alive. They're not backtracking. They're... they're trying to keep it alive but the Americans keep backtracking or moving the goalposts going there are people in every country and both of them have like kids and and people that it's in you know another very good situation and he's not thinking about them I think it's polarizing people even further isn't it there's another another example of 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 the politics continuing to polarize people rather than unify them it's a key example of how I feel have a few Iranian friends they're very well educated very cosmopolitan people and I imagine there are a lot more people like them in Iran. Very bad. Um, it's all potentially warmongering isn't it? So no, I don't, you can tell I'm not very, not a fan, not a fan. I think in the nonsense as far as I'm concerned, I mean we, as I go back to what I said, we are one world. Iran have got their way of working in their country. Great. Well, in theory, Britain, France and Germany are independent, sovereign countries who have every right under international law and under, indeed, their own laws to pursue economic and bilateral relations with any country um, in the world. The reality, of course, is very different. Britain doesn't have an independent foreign policy. Essentially, British foreign policy is made and dictated in Washington. France has a more independent foreign policy, but nonetheless, when push comes to shove, the French uh, historically do go along with what the Americans say. And Germany is a key uh, strategic ally to America. Let's not forget, after the end of the Cold War, America took a few steps back from Europe and handed over the running of Europe to Germany. So it is no surprise that the Americans are now saying to the Europeans that they expect them to not trade with Iran and to support America's hardline stance on Iran because the Americans know that there is very little leverage that those European countries have and especially when it comes to Britain and Germany. I don't think the sanctions have been that effective in relation to Iran. Countries like China, India, uh, Russia, they're continuing to trade 
with Iran. Yes, some of the European uh, countries and European companies may not be in a position to resist US sanctions, but the reality is that the wider world will continue to do business with Iran. So the losers, if you like, would be the European com countries if they decide not to do business with Iran and follow the diktat from Washington. What, if anything, can be done to stop the US from bullying other countries to conform to their policies? The public said this. I think the way that you can see the way that some of the rest of the European Union and you know people like Angela Merkel, how she treats Donald Trump, it's actually far more, uh, uh, you know, str strong, far stronger than the way we treat Donald Trump. And uh, I think we just have to stand up for our principles. And hopefully, if enough people do that, uh, he, he will heed to these uh, words, you know, instead of just doing whatever he wants. So. I don't know. I guess if, if everyone unified a little bit and we kind of called Donald Trump out on some of the stuff that he's doing, uh, then maybe. Um, but, yeah, it's, I guess it's difficult, especially with the kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, disarray in, in Europe at the moment and Brexit and all that sort of stuff. You can't interfere in a country's politics. It's up to the people that live in that country to decide their own future. You know, there's a lot of people that like Donald Trump, there's a lot of people do. Some of the things he's done, I, I think, are completely ridiculously stupid. Yeah, it's very difficult. And it's, it's, it's hard to talk about it because even though he's very powerful, he's not very smart. So it's uh, an unfortunate situation. I think the first thing is that we educate young people in terms of um, being critical about the world around them and giving them tools to understand the world around them. So I think it begins with education, whether that's in the home or whether that's in school. And I think the state school education definitely has a part to play with that. Um, so it's about getting them to open up and see various perspectives, analyzing the news, analyzing sources, getting information from different sources and then coming up with an informed view. I feel like we should all ignore him. Um, it's very difficult because he's the class clown. Um, but my, as my mother says, they should put him, the New York Times should put him in a little tiny article on page 16 uh, because he benefits from the oxygen that we're all giving him. I hope that the next election results in more Democrats in their houses and they can stop Donald Trump behaving the way he behaves and take his phone away. Everybody says it's the Trump administration. No, it's Donald Trump, period, as far as I'm concerned. The quicker you get rid of him, so there'll be a better world for it, in my humble opinion. We should welcome the fact that the 1990s, which were the golden years for America, are long past because in the 1990s, Russia had gone into meltdown politically, economically, militarily. Russian society had been destroyed because of the collapse of communism in the end of the Soviet Union. But in 2018, we have a very resurgent Russia, a very powerful Russia, a Russia which has reclaimed much of its lost superpower status. And the hope for global stability, the hope for global peace is that the Russian Federation will keep on becoming more powerful because that checks America around the world. Some people say China is also another hope. No, that is fanciful. The Chinese have made great progress in the last 40 years, and that progress is down to its economic relations with America, and Beijing is not going to compromise that or jeopardize that in any way whatsoever. So Russia is the hope. Russia has defeated American objectives in Syria, and for that, we should rejoice. There's a short answer and there's a long answer. The short answer is that resistance, resistance, resistance. The only way that America will understand that it is not the sort of domineering power that it wants to be, there are other nations who need to have relationship and commercial activity with other nations. And why should a particular nation, be it in South America, Africa or Far East follow US line if it's not in the interest of that particular nation. If Mr. Trump wants to follow the policy of USA first, then the other nations should also the fo follow the policy that their nation is first other than USA. 
America's entire agenda appears to be based on causing the world to make a choice between backing anti-Iranian US policy and pro-Iranian trade. It's a stark choice covering everything from oil to aviation and the car industry. Washington seems determined to try and show it can force the world to do it America's way, even if most other countries don't agree with President Trump. This solo approach which America is taking versus the rest of the world, almost bullying countries into submitting to its policy against Iran, is to an extent working for now. But this deal is too important to the international community for them to let America wreck it. Over time, President Trump could find that, instead of making America great again, all he will have achieved is to make America alone again on the global stage.